Hello and welcome to another Muddiest Points video. In this video we'll be going over crystal defects and this is going to be an introduction video for crystal defects. Below we have some Muddiest Points. These are questions based off of responses students have given in class. First up, what types of defects are present in crystalline materials? Are defects in materials a good or a bad thing? Where do defects come from? How do we associate defects with their respective images? And how do we find Berger's vector? Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to answer all of these questions, and we'll go over all of them at the end. Now first off, what is a defect? Well, over here to the right, you can see we have a section of lattice. A lattice is a periodic arrangement of atoms, and a defect is defined as anything that disturbs the order of the lattice. So here you can see this orange atom doesn't fit in with the rest of the lattice, which makes it a defect. Now, in order to characterize these defects, we have three different types. First, we have zero-dimensional, which are point defects, and this is any defect that affects a few neighboring atoms or lattice points. These you can see up here. This one I circled before is an example of a substitutional atom. One here is called an interstitial atom. And up on the right we have a vacancy. We'll go over all of these in a future slide. We also have one-dimensional, which are called line defects. And this is the edge of a distorted plane of atoms in the lattice. Now here you can see this plane doesn't line up with a, pl uh, with a plane below. You can see here it kind of ends abruptly, and this T symbol is a symbol to show that the plane is ended. Now the dislocation is the edge of this distorted plane, so the dislocation is right here, and it's actually extending out of the screen towards you. This is called a dislocation, and we'll go over these on a future slide as well. And lastly, we have 2D, which are called planar defects. A planar defect is the interface between adjacent grains in a lattice. Now each of these is called a grain, and we'll discuss what that means later. And where two grains meet is a surface, and this surface is the grain boundary. And a grain boundary is an example of a planar defect. Up next, we'll be going over point defects. As we said before, a point defect is any defect that affects a few neighboring atoms or lattice points. First, we have an interstitial atom, which is a zero-d point defect, where a smaller atom fits in between other atoms in a crystal lattice. What does that mean? Well, we have an interstitial up here. Up top, this is a ball and stick model, and down here we have a space-filling model. These are two different ways we can show a lattice. Now, an interstitial atom, as you can see, fits in between the normal places on the lattice. And down here you can also see the interstitial atom. And as you can see, it's squeezed in between these atoms. Interstitial atoms are obviously much smaller than the rest of the atoms in the lattice. And they introduce a very small stress on the lattice. As you can see, this plane kind of bulges out a little bit. And every defect has a certain stress field associated with it. We also have substitutional atoms, which is a point defect in which an impurity atom substitutes for a host atom. That you can see right here, and down here. And as you can see, this is taking the place of where a gray atom normally would be. And because it's larger, it also induces a bit of a bulge on these, these planes here. And that's its stress field. Both of these defects are very important material properties. An example of an interstitial atom could be iron and carbon. Carbon is a much smaller atom than iron, meaning that it can fit in these inter interstitial places, which are also called interstices. And the reason this is important is because carbon plays a role in strengthening iron, which is what makes iron become steel. A substitutional atom, an example of that, could be arsenic and silicon. Arsenic is much more similar in size to silicon, so it will actually replace a silicon atom in a lattice. 
This is a process that's commonly used in semiconductors and computer chips. Up next we have some more point defects. So here we have some more different types of point defects. We've got a vacancy, which is a location in a crystal lattice where an atom is missing. That you can see right here. And as you can tell, it has a certain stress field associated with it where the atoms kind of bulge in. That's because there's no atom there. We also have a self-interstitial, which is a point defect where the same type of atom occupies an interstitial position. So before, we saw a small atom in an interstitial position. A self-interstitial is when, let's see up here, the same type of atom takes an interstitial position. Vacancies naturally occur in metals and are important for processes like diffusion. Self-interstitial atoms are often the result of neutron irradiation. Now, if you have a nuclear reactor, there are a lot of high energy particles like this neutron here. Now, this neutron can run into an iron atom in a piece of steel and it will fly in knock this atom out of place and move it into an interstitial position. Now let's watch that happen. So as you can see behind we have left a vacancy and the original atom is now in an interstitial position. You can see it's in between the atoms. Self-interstitial atoms can be dangerous because if enough of them occur it can lead to embrittlement of the material. That wraps up what we're going to say about point defects. On the next slide, we'll go over linear defects. Now, for linear defects, we have two types, and these are called dislocations. We have an edge dislocation and a screw dislocation. An edge dislocation is a 1D line defect that is the edge of an extra half plane of atoms within a crystal lattice. That half plane is right here, as you can see. and like we saw before, it doesn't line up with these other planes. It kind of ends abruptly right there. Now, the dislocation is the edge of the extra half plane. So your dislocation is actually right here. It extends in and out of the lattice. And as you can see, this also has a stress field associated with it. In this area, there are fewer atoms. And in this area, there are more atoms. This will be more obvious in a later slide. We also have screw dislocations, which is a 1D line defect in which a path spirals around a dislocation line penetrating through otherwise individual parallel planes. These parallel planes you can see right here. And uh, the path that we're talking about, this spiral staircase-like path that wraps around and curls down through these planes. Now the dislocation line penetrates through these planes which would make it right here. On the next slide, we'll go over a geometric concept we have that helps us characterize dislocations. So we have this concept, Berger's vector. Now Berger's vector is the displacement vector that closes the loop when traversing an equal number of lattice steps around the defect. Now what does this mean? Well first, we'll define ourselves some axes we'll have the x direction and the y direction. Now let's take a starting point right here and let's take an equal number of lattice steps. What that means is we will take one, two steps in the positive x direction, one, two steps in the negative y direction, one, two steps in the negative x direction, and one, two steps in the positive y direction. As you can see, we have plus and minus 2 for the x direction and plus and minus 2 for the y direction. This brings us back to where we started, as you can see here. But you'll see that for dislocation, this doesn't happen. Now for the dislocation, let's make our starting point right here. And let's do an equal number of lattice steps around the defect. We'll take one, two steps in the positive x direction. We'll take one, two, three, four steps in the negative y direction. We'll take one, two, three, four steps in the negative x direction. And we will take one, two, three, four steps in the positive y direction. 
and we'll take another one, two steps in the positive x direction. As you can see, we have plus 2, plus 2, and minus 4 in the x direction, which should give us 0, and we have plus 4 and minus 4 in the y direction, which gives us 0, meaning we should be back to where we started. Because we aren't, we use Berger's vector to close the loop. We can also draw Berger's vector for this model here. Let's say we take this as our starting point. We will take two steps in the positive x direction. Two. We'll take one, two, three, four steps in the negative y direction. We'll take one, two, three, four steps in the negative x direction. We'll take one, two, three, four steps in the positive y direction. And one, two steps in the positive x direction. As you can see, we still didn't make it back to where we started, so we use Berger's vector to close the loop. Remember we said that each defect has a strain field associated with it. As you can see here, the atoms here are tightly compacted above the dislocation, and below the dislocation, they're more spread out. This is the strain field for dislocation, and it plays a role in materials as well. Now let's try Berger's vector for a screw dislocation. Remember, a screw dislocation is a 1D line defect in which a path spirals around a dislocation line penetrating other, through otherwise individual parallel planes. And that Berger's vector is the displacement vector that closes the loop when traversing an equal number of lattice steps around the defect. First, let's define some axes. We will call this the positive x direction. And we will call this the positive y direction. If we take this to be our starting point, we can take one, two steps in the positive x direction, one, two, three, four steps in the positive y direction, one, two, three, four steps in the negative x direction, one, two, three, four steps in the negative y direction, and one, two steps in the positive x direction. Now, last time we ended up one to the right of our starting point. Now we ended up one above our starting point. So in this case, Berger's vector goes down to our starting point. Now the reason dislocations are important is because of the way they slide through a material. On the next slide, we'll go over how dislocations move. On this slide, we'll be going over how dislocations glide. As you can see here, we have a section of lattice that doesn't have any defects associated with it. If we introduce on this lattice a shearing force, which is shown by these arrows here, which is pushing this side of the lattice this way and pushing this side of the lattice this way, it'll cause this lattice to want to deform. When this force exceeds the elastic limit that these bonds can handle, a bond here will break. What that means is this plane will then attach to this plane, and this will allow the material to deform. That is shown here. This plane has now moved over, and as you can see, this has caused the dislocation to form. Remember, this half plane right here is now abruptly stopped. If the shearing force continues, this dislocation will slide through the lattice. As you can see, it'll move and continue to move to the right until it exits the lattice. The lattice is now longer by this amount, and this is how metals can deform, which allows the metal to bend without necessarily cracking. On the next slide, we'll look at images of real dislocations and what they mean. Now here, we have an image from a TEM. This is a transmission electron microscope image. This image is magnified at about 100,000 times magnification, which is very zoomed in. Now say we have a rod of metal, like this one right here. And say we were to pull on it from the top and the bottom. This metal would get longer, as you can see, 
but it also gets a little bit thinner. Motion of numerous dislocations, which glide through the lattice, is the atomic level mechanism by which the rod elongates with permanent plastic deformation. Now what that means is, as we saw on this slide, this section of lattice has permanently changed shape. So our rod here isn't going to slide back to place after we've bent it. It is permanently plastically deformed. This wraps up what we're going to say about dislocations. On the next slide, we're going to talk about two-dimensional defects. Now, as I said briefly, a grain boundary is a 2D planar defect. And it is a planar defect that is the 2D interface between adjacent grains, which are single crystals, and a polycrystalline material. So, to the right, we have an image of some metal, say aluminum. And uh, this is at 300 times magnification and it's taken with an optical microscope. Someone took this piece of aluminum and polished it and chemically etched it so that we can see the grain boundaries. It's important to note that grains are much larger than the other defects we've talked about so far and based off of this measurement this is about a hundred microns long or a tenth of a millimeter. Meaning if we have very large grains they're actually visible to the human eye. Below, we have a not-to-scale depiction of these grains and grain boundaries by showing how the atoms do not line up. So here, all these atoms are lining up this way, and this grain, the atoms, are moving in this direction. And because these atoms don't line up, they have an interface where they meet. Now these grains are three-dimensional crystals meaning that this surface is a two-dimensional surface. That's what makes it a two-dimensional defect. On the next slide, we'll go over how these grains form. So here, we're showing formation of grains and associated grain boundaries during melt solidification of a metal. And before we said grain boundaries, the 2D interface between adjacent grains and a polycrystalline material. So we start off with a molten metal. Now, Eventually, as the temperature cools, they will form nuclei. These are small, small beginnings of crystals, as you can see here. They begin to form nuclei. Now, as the temperature cools, atoms will join each of these crystals and will be growing smaller single crystals. And as you can see, these ones are all getting larger. Now, eventually, these grains will run into each other. And the area that these run into each other is the grain boundary. This wraps up what we're going to say about grain boundaries. On the next slide, we're going back to dislocations. Now sometimes it's important for us to understand how many dislocations we have, which is why we can calculate the dislocation density. The way we can do that is dislocation density is equal to the number of dislocations divided by the area. So here we have a TEM image at about 300,000 times magnification. These are silicon atoms and based off this micron bar I've measured the height and width of this image. The height being 0.94 microns and the width being 1.1 microns. Also we can count how many dislocations we have. We have one, two, three, four dislocations. So, if we calculate the area of the image, we get 0.94 times 1.1, and that gives us 1.03 microns squared. This can also be written as 1.03 times 10 to the negative eighth centimeters squared. So to calculate the dislocation density, we can do the number of dislocations, which is 4, divided by the area, which is 1.03, which is 10 to the negative eighth, and we get 3.88 times 10 to the eighth dislocations per centimeter squared. 
This wraps up the video. Let's go back to our muddiest points. So to wrap up, what types of defects are present in crystalline materials? Check. Are defects in materials a good or a bad thing? Check. Where do defects come from? Check. How do I associate defects with their respective images? Check. And how do we find Berber's vector? Check. Thank you very much for watching.